Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Education here at the Hammer Museum. And I'm very pleased to host tonight's conversation with 5D Design is Change. I went to the 5D conference last year at Cal State Long Beach and was completely blown away by all the amazing technology that all these different fields are using for imaging and narrative and how they all were brought together so beautifully under the 5D umbrella. And you'll hear more about that tonight. But um, So I asked them to come here and bring us some of their most innovative, fascinating speakers. And that's what we've got tonight. Um, and I'm very pleased to announce this will be the first of an ongoing series of talks here. We're going to have an introduction to 5D by Chris Goetz. And then our moderator, Pauline Q, is going to set up the context of tonight's discussion. And then she'll introduce each of the panelists. They'll present for about 10 minutes about their own work. And then they'll all sit down and have a discussion, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So Christopher Scotes is the director of the University Art Museum at Cal State Long Beach. He was formerly the chief curator at the University Art Museum at UC Santa Barbara. And in addition to being one of the principal founders of the 5D conference, um, I think just watching the amazing stuff he's been doing in Long Beach, that he's always exploring these different boundaries and intersections of all areas of the arts and technology in his curatorial work and in his writing. And you should all take advantage of having him here and go and check out the museum, the University Art Museum in Long Beach. Anyway, please join me in welcoming Christopher Scotes. Hi, and welcome. It's great to see such a wonderful crowd here this evening. Um, I am the co-director of the 5D conference with Alex McDowell. Alex, unfortunately, could not make it this evening. He's currently working on a new film called Upside Down in Montreal, uh, but he does wish he could be here this evening, and I know he would be thankful for just such a wonderful crowd here this evening. Um, if you're not familiar with 5D, we, we held the first conference in 2008 at Cal State Long Beach, and 5D looks at the future of immersive design through all narrative media, including architecture, TV, animation, gaming, film, and the visual arts. And we're currently working on the conference for 2010, which will take place at Cal State um, October 7th through the 9th. But for 2009, we've been organizing a series of distributed events. And there was a series of panels that took place at the FMX conference in Stuttgart in Germany early this year. Tyler Krukowski moderated a panel at the iDesign conference in London. Peter Plantik, who I think is here this evening, uh, moderated a panel of it, at Mundus Digitalis in Spain um, this year, too. So we are all over the globe in terms of the, the programs that we're beginning to develop. And a little closer to home, just two weeks ago, we held a, a panel called The Architecture of Sound that was moderated by uh, John Underkoffler of Oblong Industries. And our curator of education at the museum, Brian Trimble, put together a wonderful event last week called Fast and Fantastic, which is our high school digital day, where we had over 300 high school students from around Southern California talk to industry professionals, attend workshops and presentations. So the goal of 5D is really from, uh, it's, it's about education, it's about talking to indus industry professionals, presentations, workshops, panels, and the like. And so please check out the 5D website, 5dconference.com, for all of the wonderful things taking place for 2010. But just to kind of tease you a little bit, we're working on our themes for next year, which include a bigger bang, where art and science collide, transmedia, the role of commerce in building new worlds, data as narrative space. And we expect the conference to take place over three days, so we're expanding the conference and the venue. So it promises to be an incredible event. Pauline Q, who has been working with 5D for the past two years, is really responsible for this evening's panel. It's the second in a series of Design is Change programs that we're organizing. The first one took place at MoMA in New York just a few weeks ago. And Pauline has done an incredible job along with her company, the Unified Field Corporation. So many thanks to Pauline for the great work that she has done in organizing this evening's events. And I know there will be a Design is Change event taking place in Long Beach at the Aquarium in the new year. And I'm sure she'll be more than happy to talk to you about that this evening, too. So thanks for being here. And I'd like to uh, welcome Pauline Q. Wow. Hi, everyone. Um, 
I'm really happy to be here and to have you all uh, here for the second event of Design is Change. Um, Design is Change is a program that uh, I helped create at 5D to bring together immersive media designers with social change and humanitarian designers so that we can address our role and our responsibility in the kinds of media we create, the content we, we tell stories about, um, the worlds that we build in that content that we create so that we move ourselves into a better world, an emerging future that we know is all possible. Um, I'd like to go through my presentation of, of what Design is Change um, is in tonight's program. Um, just a bit of an intro. So, what is Design is Change? Very simply. So we have um, all these amazing designers, visual effects, animation artists, architects, production designers, um, scientists, um, uh, fashion designers, costume designers that are working together to create these amazing worlds in feature films and in digital games, um, interactive experiences online. And um, we have such an opportunity to make a difference for the better, for our communities, for our kids, for the, the way that we live today and into tomorrow. Um, so I talk about design as change as a vision of our emerging future because the emerging future that I, that I feel, I know, I believe is possible is, is something that is better than what's going on today. And we know all the problems that are, we have today. So I hope that this industry, these disciplines that work together can collaborate and do something that can help us move into that better future. And so Chris um, described what 5D is and what we're doing, um, but it's really a just huge array of different people. It doesn't just include designers, it doesn't just include folks in the entertainment industry where, it, where, this, um, where 5D began, but it's really a conversation that needs to be um, connecting everybody because the world that we build includes everyone. We need to include everybody on the right and the left, um, right, le right brain, left brain. Um, everybody needs to be involved in the storytelling um, opportunities that we have and to use media the way we can to do something really good. So Design is Change is exploring lots of different things, which include, um, at MoMA, we, uh, we talked about imagination and about imagination at play. And when we, when we use our intuition and our imagination and play in the process of designing communities or places or our spaces, um, how does that change what we design and how we feel when we're designing it and what we hope to impart to the people that we're designing for. So we're going through everything from um, imagination, intuition, inception, um, intelligence, but we're also talking about spirit and really essentially humanity and our connection to each other. So our role and our responsibility. We definitely have a role and responsibility. We can see um, easily the influence that immersive media has on the real world. Um, and I'll show some examples coming up. Better world, brighter future, um, just with more connection, better relationships, and so forth. So, okay. And for me, I'm, I didn't come from the entertainment industry. I didn't come from the world of visual effects or, or production design. I don't, I've never worked on a film. and I've never worked on a digital game. I came from architecture, and I also did graphic design for many years. And I also worked on some humanitarian projects um, village building, um, eco-village building for children in South Africa and some micro-enterprise projects in Kenya. And that really built a strong foundation in me that whatever I do, the work that I choose to do must have some purpose that serves society, that serves people, that serves the, the better um, world that we want to live in. Okay. So one um, designer that I love, Jonathan Harris, um, I'm going to use him as an example. Um, for design has changed because the, the work that he does is a computer scientist and a designer. And more recently, I've discovered some of his writing and his, his, his thinking um, is really a model of what design has changed can be. So he has a project called We Feel Fine, and it's, um, it's this beautiful interactive world online where he's taken um, data from blogs 
filtered through the phrase, I feel, and has produced um, these amazing visualizations for everybody um, to see to see themselves in the data and, and provides it in a beautiful way that we can all, or hopefully all of us can get connected to what, how we feel more and we can see how the world is feeling together. So it was a beautiful project. And just the idea of him working in cyberspace with data, with data that we are actually collectively putting into cyberspace together and giving that back to us. And he's giving that back to us in beautiful, beautiful information graphics. You know, it's like this is the top 2,500 feelings or the top 500 feelings. Um, and it's interactive, so we can, we can look and see who's feeling what way in which country or by, like, there were some things by weather, by words, by, um, by location, and so forth. So, um, so this project, this work, is, it's not only beautiful because it's visually stunning, um, I think it's really beautiful because it's profoundly personal and it's spiritual and it's intelligent. The quality of the content is given to us with a level of respect. And, it, and it, I think when I visit the site, or when I have visited the site, I haven't been there specifically in a, in a while, but I feel like someone really cares about those things, those feelings and how we're all, all connected. So it just really spoke to me in a really wonderful way. So what these images that you're seeing now are part of um, a book that he's actually published about um, from images from the project, which is also wonderful because he's giving it, into yet, uh, giving it to us in yet another immersive um, media experience. And what's really exciting to me about having put this interactive, active information in a book that's static and not interactive is that then we have to self-immerse ourselves into the information and realizing that we're there, we have to understand those stories that are, that are being told by people everywhere around the world and our connection to it and how we feel about those. So it's really amplifying our understanding of how we feel about ourselves and the world around us. In the world of 5D, we have all these amazing, beautiful, sometimes apocalyptic visions in feature films and so forth. And, and, these, and these images are actually becoming part of our reality. So I'll just go through these really quickly. Grand Theft Auto, Halo. You know, and, and as designers, we're choosing, as storytellers, we're choosing to tell these stories and to give these images to the communities, the people, the, the, the world, because these things are seen by millions and millions of people around the world. I just, I really believe that we can improve some of those things to help ourselves. So yes, yeah, so, so it's about um, engaging authenticity, self-reflection, the depth of our communication with each other, and real relationship building. and. And I think what's very exciting about immersive media and, and information and data as narrative, it's um, we can use all of these inputs from everybody to really understand what we really want and where we really want to go. Okay. So this is, now this is reality. This is Dubai. That's, a, that's Dubai in the daytime. Okay. And this is Hong Kong. This is from Manufactured Landscapes by Edward Bertinsky. So these are the spaces in between all of those big, massive buildings that, you know, not everybody sees, but they're there. And people have to experience these things, and it's just not, it doesn't feel good. So and this is the kind of life many people have to have in order to make those worlds possible. So we're also, in Design as Change, we're also addressing the the impulses or the, the reasons why we do what we do, the things, the reasons why we choose the life that we're, the, the kind of life that we're putting out there in front of us. Okay. So what do we have to look forward to? 
And I'm just going to keep going through some images pretty quickly here. So there's some new designs, like really fantastic, beautiful. This is, I mean, it's beautiful. I don't know what it's going to be used for, but. You know, and this is a, you know, architecture really being, wanting to be part of it. It's like, it wants to be the stone. And it looks great, just I wonder how it functions. And this is really interesting. The, the, the pleats are meant to be solar panels. So that's an interesting vision. So in, and in the work that we do in design is change, we strive for what, you know, sustainability, you know, environmental sustainability or social sustainability um, um, or economic sustainability and cultural sustainability. And like, what are, the th what are the kind of things that we need to design in order to create that, that place for our future? And here are some um, images from Good Magazine, a design contest they did to, uh, for livable street design. So this is a before, and this is an after. Adding more trees, adding some hopefully clean energy mass transportation. L LA looks great. Now, I don't know if this looks great, but they're trying to include lots of different things to make it cleaner, lighter, hopefully more pedestrian. So I'm showing you pictures of the places and communities that we live. It's connected to the, the concept of language because in, in why we create new language and why we, why we do what we do really has a lot to do with the places that we are and what those, the language that grows out of the places that we create for each other. So we're constantly reinforcing behaviors, we're constantly reinforcing feelings, constantly reinforcing ways of being um, and interactions through the designs we do and the language we create and the places we build. So. Okay. So mission driven, you know, mission driven design is design that really wants to accomplish something of purpose with a positive social humanitarian impact, I hope. And I think this industry has a lot to say about, a lot to share, a lot to say about where we're going to go into the future. And um, just a, a brief about what's coming, what was. So that was MoMA. Um, really great panel on imagination at play, reimagine your world. Um, and this event, which is fantastic. I'm really excited. I can't wait to have everybody on stage and we can all talk together. Um, February 14th is the day after the TED conference, which is happening in Long Beach. Um, we're having Sylvia Earle, who won the TED Prize last year um, for her amazing work in um, ocean conservation. Um, April 22nd, just around Earth Day, uh, Majora Carter will be coming back here to um, lead another event. So it's really, people are catching on. People really like the idea of connecting sustainability or social good or humanitarian good with the entertainment industry, all this big media. It's really, really exciting and the opportunity is just huge. And some other things that we're um, hoping to plan, um, you know, there's another, besides those, uh, those other two events, there's another three events that will happen before the biennial in October. And I'm just going to leave you with a few images from um, Flower, which is a, a video game um, by a company called That Game Company. And they have some really stunning images of our world. Okay, so, well, I didn't really use my notes at all. <laughs> okay, so happy to be here at the Hammer. Um, to talk about the language of world building. We're going to be talking about questions like, how can our deeper understanding of language inform designs for a better world? How does design of new language allow us to determine the influence and the direction of the worlds we build? And as storytellers and world builders in immersive media, how can we use new language and storytelling to change the world? I'm really excited to have um, three amazing innovators in their fields here with me tonight. 
Joanne Couture Marin, she's the creator of the Allosphere. Kevin Carpenter, Director of Operations and Hardware at Hanson Robotics. And Amber Case, a cyborg anthropologist. Um, as Claudia said, they'll each give their presentation, followed by a moderated Q&A, and then we'll open it up for as long of a Q&A with the audience as we can. That's, we really want to focus on having a dialogue with you. So thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm very honored to be here tonight at Hammer Museum to discuss with you a new non-dialectic language that we are making in order to use computing using all of your senses and how we might be able to use this new language as a creative process to map voluminous amounts of data in this information-rich age. For a number of years, there's a team of us researchers at the University of California, Santa Barbara. We're artists, scientists, and engineers, and we found a way to work creatively in consort, mapping n-dimensional data sets in time and space, much the same way that a composer would compose a piece of music, or an artist or a designer would design a work of art. Now, this is leading to a new method, a new computational framework, a new language that is going to allow us to work with very complex data, whether we're a computer scientist building a new system, or a physicist working on higher dimensional equations, or an artist mapping new terrains and data for new artworks. And the interesting thing is all of these areas are starting to overlap, as I think you'll see in a video that I'll play for you that will show you the uh, information in a minute. But as I said, in order to work with this data, we need a method to map this data, and we need an instrument that's a large enough canvas for us to represent this data. And in, for that event, I have designed and created a new instrument. It's a three-story metal sphere in an echo-free chamber that we call the allosphere that's really designed as a large, dynamically varying digital microscope that could be connected to a supercomputer and will allow us to perform this instrument as an ensemble of musicians would walk onto a design stage, pick up their important instrument, and play their data, whether it's complex physics or a beautiful work of art. So right now I'd like to roll a video that's going to show you this information, show you the facility, and is going to show you the research that we're doing, and then we'll be able to engage in an interesting dialogue after my other colleagues present their work. So this video is going to show you the facility, which is at the California Nanosystems Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. What is a digital media center doing in a California Nanosystems Institute? A building that has been designed to go from the polymer to the application, new materials research for information technology systems. We're doing a virtual fly-through right now into the allosphere, a three-story metal sphere in a near to echo free chamber. Now we're going to go into the sphere and we're going to actually cut into a real world picture of the sphere. 20 researchers can fit on that bridge and be inside of their data. And for you to really know that it's a sphere, we're going to go outside and you're going to see that we're actually in a sphere. And right now you see researchers going into an atom watching electrons spin. A group of researchers going into a material atom lattice, sculpting with atoms, and now a group of researchers actually flying into the cortex of my colleague's brain, where it's been mapped into a new world, and we have intelligent agents that are singing for you the blood density levels and reporting them back to you as sounds and as sonic environment. This is leading to a new form of how we're actually working with our data. A little bit about who we are. I'm a composer, orchestrally trained. Along with my other visual artist colleagues, I work with my scientists, map very complex mathematical algorithms unfolding in time and space, with our media systems engineers who are building new systems with content driving technology. Ours is a new redefinition of art, science, and engineering, a new age of the Renaissance. 
Now we're going to fly into five research projects that are going to take you all the way from fMRI ba brain data down to electron spin. This first project we call the Allobrain. It attempts to quantify beauty by determining which regions of the brain are most active when witnessing something beautiful. We're flying through the cortex of my colleague Marcos Novak's brain. Our narrative here is a literal visual and sonic mapping of the data from an fMRI machine. The brain now a world through which we can navigate. Twelve intelligent computer agents, the rectangles that you see on the screen, are flying through the brain with us, data mining blood density levels and reporting them to us sonically. Higher blood density levels signal more activity in that region of the brain. They literally sing the densities with higher pitches mapped into those higher densities. One can imagine the applications from medical diagnostics to psychological studies in cognition and perception, as well as the beautiful art that it makes. We're going to move now into my left brain. We move into real biological data from to biogenerative algorithms that are now creating artificial nature in this artistic scientific installation. Biogenerative algorithms facilitate our understanding of self-organization and growth, important areas of research in the nanoscale sciences. For the arts, these biogenerative algorithms generate new worlds for artistic exploration. The algorithms begin a sonic communication and interaction as a swarm of insects in the real nature. Researchers interact with this world in real time, generating bacterial code that literally feeds the insects as they grow over time. As we move now from the biological and macroscopic world, we enter the world of atoms. By flying through a new materials compound for clean technology, the multicenter hydrogen bond, a very important step for fabrication of new materials for energy efficiency. As we navigate through the bond, we view the bonding of four blue zinc atoms with one white hydrogen atom. The sonic information is the literal mapping of the emission spectrums of the oxygen, zinc, and hydrogen into the audio domain. You are literally hearing these atoms sing their emission spectrums with precise mathematical mapping of light frequencies into sound frequencies. The installation reveals a beautiful static art that can be navigated, seen, and heard, witnessing the structure and the static function of electron flow. Um, in this research, the artists have uncovered new forms of, of art and new scientific visualizations. Now we're going down to one atom as we move into a more complex n-dimensional data flow based on the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. In 3D, mapping the superposition of hydrogen's single electron in various orbital paths. We see the probability wave function of the electron showing the possibility of where this electron could be at any point in time. Those are the white bubbles in the back. Um, we are also seeing, along with this, these streamer lines, which are showing the probability flow of the electron in its, excuse me, various orbitals. The state reveals light emission. As the single electron jumps into two orbitals, you can hear the pulsing. That's when a photon is being emitted because the electron are in orbitals close enough to emit a photon. You can hear it better than you can see it, which is very interesting to our physicists in understanding multimodal representation of sound. As the ring contracts, a photon is released. This exhibit is allowing us to map the mathematical constructs for information flow, very important for function or how we as artists want to move information among structural points. Our collaborators at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics at UCSB have never seen this information before. Now this final project represents the coherent procession of electron spin. This is real data coming from a spintronic center and from, um, uh, from different lasers that are actually hitting this quantum dot. Our colleagues at the Center for Spintronics and Quantum Computation are measuring decoherence of individual electrons in an adjacent lab. Here the experiment is recreated virtually by simulating the mathematical model. By transposing the measurement into perceivable frequencies, we elucidate the musical nature of quantum information flow. This project serves as a demonstration of the value of applying multimodal representation uh, to the abstractions of quantum computing. So, with these brief demonstrations and showing you this, in, this instrument, I believe we show you this new form of non-dialectic language that we're making that are really crossing the cultural divide among artists, scientists, and engineers, and are really coming up with a new form that we can communicate with one another using technology to really transform humanity. Thank you for listening to me.
Hello? Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> um, like Joanne said, we are at the very beginning stages of a really fascinating renaissance. Um, and I say that while the presentation's coming up, where um, it, it's fascinating over the last few years to see how many people who are right brain thinkers, you know, in the arts, in television, in movies, in, you know, artists, really embracing their left brain side, their technical side, and coming to a center point where, you know, you can really become a renaissance man and affect change in society and humanity because you, you have the benefit of looking at both sides of reality and what's happening and using both sides of your brain and um, looking at data, analyzing data, um, and kind of coming up with better solutions to problems. So, I'm Kevin Carpenter. I work at uh, Hanson Robotics. And um, there we go. Um, today I'm going to be just doing a quick run through of like three hours jammed into 10 minutes. But uh, hopefully we can discuss this afterwards. Um, human intelligence versus artificial intelligence and the singularity versus the convergence. Let's see, it's that one. Okay, like I was just saying, um, Putting the artists back in the equations. Um, I, I put this slide up here because it's a reference point to everything that's going on in the field of artificial intelligence, simulated sentience, um, artificial consciousness. All the people kind of in academia that are presenting forth the theories and what's going to happen in these doomsday scenarios about robots taking over, they all exist on this left brain side in academia. And there are very few right brain people that are actually looking at consciousness, intelligence, sentience, awareness, and saying, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. There's a whole nother side of things that you're completely discounting out of your equations. Um, and of course, Star Trek is the awesome reference here where you, you need, in order for true wisdom, true leadership, and a greater understanding, greater problem solving, you need both the logic and the compassion um, and bring it together. Okay, again, uh, this is my favorite quote of all time recently. Um, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And that's uh, Einstein. So there's, there's only two possible solutions. One, you create machines, another biological entity. You create something that is more intelligent than you to solve your problems. Or you just raise your own consciousness and solve your problems. And obviously the second choice is much easier um, artificial intelligence, as presented, right now in pop culture um, and storytelling, we have uh, a whole gamut of movies and sci-fi books, and they all kind of present this instantaneous awakening and these fully conscious machine intelligence that just all of a sudden one day are fully conscious. And then, um, there's, all, and then there's a whole segment of movies that portray already existing conscious machines battling it out with humans, blah, blah, blah. Um, but these representations, um, there are three of the basic representations. Pure artificial, computer-based, which is like HAL from 2001. Um, pure, pure biological computational agents, which would be kind of like androids. And a hybrid, which would be kind of like a transhumanist or a bi bionic man. But don't panic. It's not, it's not all doom and gloom, because it's only the left brain people talking. So artificial intelligence is really, when you look at it from the center perspective, is a coming of age story. And it's something that pop culture and movies and sci-fi have kind of avoided this question. And they have, um, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, they're missing a critical part of the story. And that's the part of the story that's happening right now. It's the story of how did it happen? It, it just didn't all of a sudden happen, and all of a sudden there was consciousness, or all of a sudden there was awakening of a machine. There is this evolution, and it's the story of the human side of things, the human evolution alongside of the technology evolution, which we are living in right now, and both are evolving simultaneously. It's not just computers and computing power and machine perception that's evolving. So it's time for a new discussion um, about awareness. Um, there's, no one is really having a philosophical or sociological 
debate or questioning um, what's kind of presented about artificial intelligence. And it all comes back to humanity. Um, what, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to, um, you know, we are just now beginning to understand through physics and science that we, we haven't really understood our environment. We haven't really understood our history. We haven't really understood nature. We're just now starting to understand mind and consciousness and, and these things are changing all these old paradigms. So the 35 year old artificial intelligence story that's been presented in media is evolving to adapt to this. Um, I'm one of those people that believe that it's, it's very important to do this research and it's very important to strive for artificial intelligence only from the perspective that in the process of doing so, we are changing, like we are evolving as humans because we are now asking the questions um, that we need to be asking about what it means. Like when you, when you start playing God and messing around with DNA and messing around with genes and start trying, to map, start trying to map the brain, you start asking the questions about, well, gosh, what does it mean? Like we're learning about our brain and our consciousness in the process. So it may, it may not even matter if machine intelligence rises somehow. It's that we will have evolved at the same time. So um, a distinction between consciousness and intelligence. It's, it's far, 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 far from being defined. Um, if, if you go on the internet and just type in the difference, you'll notice that the left brain people, they don't distinguish between the two. They completely discount consciousness at all in terms of what artificial intelligence is and how it'll all of a sudden awaken and, and form this consciousness. And they're forgetting about the fact that they haven't taken the time to actually define what is intelligence, how do you quantify intelligence, how do you measure intelligence, how do you quantify consciousness, how do you measure consciousness, how would you even know if a machine is conscious, um, how, how do you know that humans are conscious. Um, and so they're, they're just barreling forward on saying that, oh, machines are going to take over in 50 years when they awaken, awaken. But they haven't actually done the very, very elementary step of defining what is awakening in human, in humanity. Okay, I use the term convergence and a lot of other people have um, as an alternate to the singularity. Um, I have a slide a little while, a little further down about the singularity, but convergence, um, well actually I'll just do it now. The singularity is the idea that machine computing power uh, is escalating and it's Moore's law and at some point in time you'll have the computational power of all human brains and at that point in time the machine will just spontaneously be aware of something. Um, but the convergence on the other hand is the idea that there's this greater you know, energy um, consciousness field out there that we're all tapping into, we just don't know it. And the convergence is the point when all of a sudden we, as a, as a planet, start realizing that, hey, we can have a singularity at the same time, and it doesn't have anything to do with machine computing. We can do it ourselves. Um, okay. So important questions that I like asking um, are, Again, how do you measure, measure and quantify levels of awareness and consciousness in humans? It's questions that aren't being asked or presented. Um, let's see. A little bit nervous. <laughs> um, consciousness and intelligence um, currently, like if you tried to quantify human consciousness or human intelligence, uh, you come to the conclusion that there are so many different levels, like anyone you meet, all of you out there, there would be 200 and some different levels of consciousness and different levels of intelligence between all of you. Um, and how do you, how do you measure that? How do you quantify that? It, especially when it's based on your particular environment, your upbringing, your childhood, your family values, your, your job, everything is, is culminating in, in how conscious you are. Um, and robots and artificial intelligence, they may awaken, but it's not going to be anything like is portrayed in pop culture for this reason that, let's say hypothetically, that um, computers or machines actually do start making the connections that humans do. 
Well, it's an evolution like humans, like a child, where you see small steps of recognition. You know, year one, something happens and there's a little bump in consciousness. Then you go to high school and then you go to college. And, and every action and every experience and every adventure and every sort of interaction you have with other people um, is bumping up your level of consciousness. Well, that's theoretically how that would happen with machines as well, is they would have to have this sort of time period where, um, where they're evolving. It just wouldn't happen spontaneously because it doesn't happen spontaneously even with humans. Some people go their whole life and never <laughs> have a high level of consciousness, but they're extremely intelligent people. Um, So some, some questions that I like to ask um, are intelligent, well, systems are only as intelligent at, or they're only as good as their sensor inputs. So you start um, in, in the field of artificial intelligence that I'm in, robotics, um, the subset, we're designing robots that have kind of simulated sentience, which is about as best as they can have. And the current level of simulated sentience is, um, kind of like what Michio Kaku stated as a retarded cockroach. You know, our most advanced robot, the Mars Pathfinder, is like, has the intelligence of a retarded cockroach. And that's right now. So, you know, it's only based on the sensors that you have, all the data coming in. And they like to say, well, if you can see it and then hear it, and then somehow that's the perception and the robot will have everything it needs to awaken. But um, they're forgetting all of the sort of sixth sense inputs that we're, we're, we're experiencing all the time. You know, uh, the idea that you know when someone's staring at you, behind you, from across the room, you just know it. You, you have that feeling. You have feelings that you've been somewhere before, deja vu, you have synchronicities where you, the, the moment you think something, like, I need to talk to this person, I haven't talked to them in a while, and then the phone rings. Well, how, how would you program that into a machine? How would you program like an animal senses danger what, what sort of program would you write and what sort of inputs and sensors would you need to actually sense danger? You know, there is this other field out there that um, this, uh, this field of study, they're not even addressing any of that. It's still just based on the pure five sense inputs. Let's see. Um, as a side note, for this reason, it's, it's also an interesting note that in the event that enough sensors were actually put in place, um, like a large complex system would be the, the highest likely candidate to awaken. It wouldn't be a robot. It wouldn't be anything this small. It would be something that has m unlimited power, um, unlimited uh, inputs. So maybe a city or a building, that would be the first likely candidate that would actually even remotely have a chance of making the connections to be aware. Um, so even in pop culture, this, this idea that a robot that just has an uplink somewhere, it, it would be kind of like the very last thing to evolve. It would be much larger systems first. Uh, again, the singularity, it's, it's, here I'll go. Singularity is not near. <laughs> I think it's kind of a flawed premise, um, mostly because it completely takes out um, it, its premise is that biological intelligence is fixed. I mean, that is, that is part of their, their premise. And biological intelligence is not fixed. Like, you can't just assume that humans are not evolving because you can see that humans are evolving at a, at a, at a rapid pace right now. And so, you know, and machine computing may reach the power of all the brains, but it's only a left brain you know, perspective of this. And the brain is more than just the computing. And, and you know, the number of com computations you run doesn't equal intelligence either. So here's that curve, just for reference. Um, transhumanism is another sort of post-human thing where um, they believe the singularity at some point in time, machine computing could be, you know, incorporated in with humans to make us superhumans and it's 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 only done on this body and mind level you know it's it's done on this left brain perspective that all there is to a human is body and mind so let's enhance the body and enhance the mind and somehow we'll be supermen or something 
Um, and it's missing the point that we're more than just body and mind. We're also tapping into this consciousness field because we're spirit as well. So, news flash. Human beings are evolving rapidly. They don't like to advertise this, but we are evolving quite rapidly. Um, our DNA is changing. Junk DNA is not junk. They're finding this out. It's becoming activated. Um, there are reasons for this. Um, also, you know, we're evolving at such a rate where we're, we're so far removed from people 5,000 years ago than, than those people 5,000 years ago were to Neanderthals. So we are changing. Our DNA is changing. Our structure is changing. Our thoughts are changing. Our consciousness is changing. And this has to be incorporated into this model. Um, again, in human, human intelligence is, is increasing. Now, this kind of goes back with how would, you, how would you quantify machine intelligence? Well, um, you know, right now we use IQ tests to, to model human intelligence. Well, could we give an IQ test to a computer? I mean, it, it's not based on just computing speed. I mean, we could measure the computing speed of my brain, but it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't tell you how intelligent I am um, because there's been an increase in sort of abstract problem solving and intuitive, intuitive means of intelligence which means more people are just kind of tapping into the field. I'm going to skip. Well, this is exciting, so I'll get to it. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons, I, I like to get into a little bit of the, the reasons why humans are changing. Um, index of mass human excitability. This is a Russian um, scientist who charted out, going back to 500 BC, um, all of the periods of increasing solar activity and how it was directly linked with sunspot, spot, sunspot cycles and how it was linked to every sort of major market crash, economic growth, recession, periods of um, migrations, expeditions, revolutions, wars. They all, like on a graph, he graphed it out. You can see that these things happen in, during these periods when there are the highest sunspot cycles. So the good news is we're in one right now, 2009 to 2016. Um, we are in this mass human excitability where all of us, as in, all of us in mass as a species, are getting excited by solar energy output. So it's just up to us mentally and to make a decision. It's like, do we want riots, you know, wars, or do we want revolutions and societal breakthroughs at a collective level? It's like the time is right now. We just have to do it. So I wanted to get you all excited about that. So what does this have to do with um, robotics? Um, in terms of robotics, we have a really fascinating project um, that, it, that we're doing. It's called Xeno. And it's, called, uh, it's about social robotics. And it has to do with this coming of age story. And it's, here's Xeno right here. Um, he's a robot in development that's almost about to be introduced. But the fascinating thing about this is that um, when you start asking questions like how, does a, how do you program a robot to have empathy? How do, how do you program morality? How do you program loyalty? How do you program all of these human type, type traits into a machine? And then you have to ask questions, well, how in the world do you program it into a human? It has to do with your upbringing. You know, um, it has a lot to do with just sort of psychology and, and sociology. That if, if, if a robot was put in a loving home, caring, and it was brought up in a right way, would it have empathy? Or if, you, it had a, you know, if it was brought up in an abusive family and an alcoholic father and it was beaten, would, would it then have the opposite of that? You know, and, and so the question comes about is um, we can't let, we can't leave this to the left brain academics to determine what, the, what artificial intelligence will be, or what direction it'll, it'll go. And so our whole premise is, why not create this robot that basically is a platform for artificial intelligence development? Everybody, everybody who buys one, you're contributing to making the links, making the connections. You know, it, it's, you, you have it at home. You can you know, open source software. You can start experimenting around with giving it virtues. Uh, you know, making one, making it have vanity or making it be popular and, and go through these experiments that would, um, would better encompass the whole range of experiences that humans have 
just to see what happens um, in an attempt to, to evolve this forward. That's really it. I have this video, which is just a few seconds. It's just of Zeno walking. But, uh, yeah. So that's, that's pretty much our premise at our company, is that um, there are many uh, military applications that are happening right now with robotics, and they're, they're really looking at artificial intelligence. And they're coming from the left brain perspective that, well, it can really only be used as kind of a weapon and what happens if it takes over. And so we're, we're chartered with, well, how would you evolve friendly artificial intelligence, if at all? And the way to do it is to have everybody be in on the development of what artificial intelligence is and simulated sentience um, and programming it with, with you know, with virtues and making it be a, a friend. Um, did it start? So, this is just a highlight of, of where we're at in the development of this particular robot. So it is really kind of along the lines of the AI super toy um, concept where, you know, we wanted to make it kind of Japanime looking. Um, it, you know, it has some form of sentience right now where it'll, it'll, it'll look at you, it'll remember your face, it'll remember conversations, it'll have conversations, it gets on the internet, it'll tell you what the weather's like, it'll, you know, and, but it's a completely kind of open source architecture where if you had one of these, you can start programming it, you know, to, to do whatever you wanted it to do in an attempt to try to understand. Um, again, the whole idea is that in the process, as humans, if you had a robot like this to just kind of play around with, you're discovering stuff about yourself and your own humanity in the process. So thank you very much. Again. Hello, everyone. My name is Amber Case, and I am a cyborg anthropologist, which is something a little bit different than what most people hear. When I was little, I thought about, um, you know, there's this industrial revolution, all these things that have happened. Why isn't there a really great revolution that's going on in my lifetime? Why can't I see something cool ha happen? And then what happened is that these computers started showing up on everyone's desks, and these computers started colonizing everyone's pockets and crying, and then you had to plug them into the wall, and then they got annoying. And so I ended up saying, what's going on? Is there a framework to understand all this? And I ended up finding out, yes, there is. It's called cyborg anthropology and prosthetic culture. So what's cyborg anthropology? You take regular anthropology and you apply it to human-computer interaction and these little external prosthetic devices that we use to access that invisible information that's everywhere, but yet we can't touch it unless we buy some really expensive device or some sort of computer that sometimes has bugs. How does this affect culture? How is value dispersed, et cetera, et cetera? That's basically the overview. So when I say cyborg, most people think of this. They think of uh, Terminator or something like that. But this hasn't happened yet, only in the films. So let's talk about prosthetic culture first. This is Amy Mullins, and she has prosthetic legs. But she's been able to, these are called her cheetah legs, by the way. She's able to um, basically break land speed records with these things. So in a way, her technical disability, as we would call it, has become something greater. In the same way, these devices that we use make us greater as well. So the term cyborg, where did it come from? 1960 paper on space travel, and was used to describe a, an organism to which exogenous components had been added for the purpose of adapting it to new environments. OK, what does this mean? Uh, this, right? This is a very difficult environment. There's a bunch of radiation, so a spacesuit. So we have our own spacesuits, but first let's talk about this guy named Steve Mann. He came up with the first wearable computer. This is 80 pounds of equipment. <laughs> he used to wear this all day, every day, except when he was showering and swimming. He wore this all the way around the MIT campus, and it took him an entire year before he got a friend to don the same equipment and walk around college with him. 
He's fascinating, though, because he said, well, what's, what's going to happen to this technology? Well, this 80 pounds is going to turn into 40, and then 20, and then 10, and now it'll fit into a convenient pair of stylish sunglasses, which I can wear around and text people with this little handy keycorder device in my left hand, and upload it to the internet. So we did. And now it's in a pair of convenient and less stylish glasses. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's move on for a second and talk about fruit. So I look at this apple and I say, oh, look, it's ripe. Look at this texture, the weight, the color. This is excellent. This is a great apple. And if I were in a forest, I'd pick it from the tree and just start chomping it. But now I'm in a supermarket. That's our natural forest. Has anything really changed? Well, we're looking at these nice boxes and we say, hey, that product's ripe. I really like that product. Nike's a really nice ripe product because it has this design and this aesthetic and it weighs this much. This is great. So this is how we choose. Now Steve Mann goes into a store and his, um, his little glasses tell him, hey, that product, and it identifies it with recognition. And then he says, I never want to see that product ever again, and it blanks it out. So he goes through the store and only sees the products that he wants, right? So he's not digging around like all of us saying, what are you, oh, I can't figure this out. You know, so, so he has a more efficient shopping experience. And if you think of this as data, this is how we're combing through the internet. We say, we never want to see that site again, and we press the back button and it's gone. Okay, so let's talk about hammers. Since we're at the Hammer Museum, I figured I'd put one of these. So. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, here's a hammer, left side. Now we have a hammer here. What's changed? Not that much. The, the design, the shape, the, the functionality of the hammer is not that much different at all. But now we look at this, 1956, this is 10 megabytes of data. I always wanted to send a Pan American jet to somebody's house with an MP3 file on it and say, here, here's some music for you. <laughs> By the way, you owe me $25,000. <laughs> so what's changed? Here's this. Here's this. Wow, what does this do? This looks crazy. This is like this little piece of metal that you carry around. What are these people doing with this? What does the form of this talk about how it functions? What does the form of this talk about how it functions? This is pure function. Here's a hammer. It's been this way for 2,000 years. In only 50 years or 60 years, this has become morphed and it's becoming smaller and lighter and lighter until what happens? Well, does it disappear? Well, I guess we'll find out in the future. So, for instance, you put data into a computer and it doesn't get heavier. You put data into an iPhone, it doesn't get heavier. You take data in real life, analog data, and you put it onto a scrapbook and you end up having 20 scrapbooks and then there's a flood and you lose all of your scrapbooks. Here, <laughs> you have, this is actually a campaign for Mac Store, which is a hard drive company. They printed out eight years of digital photos and they said, well, how much space does this take? Well, it takes up that much space. So every time you're walking around with your laptop, you're carrying around this much stuff. Isn't this amazing? There's time and space compression on all your data. How fascinating, you know, what, what gods we are. Like, our ability to smash a bunch of stuff. It's like in Mary Poppins, how she comes over to the house and she starts, like, taking lamps out of this bag of nowhere. She totally had the internet. She totally had a computer way back then. So, okay, so now I look at my phone and it's a little scrying pool. Now, a scrying pool is something that you use like in fantasy novels and you say, I want to see what's happening on the other side of the world or whatever this wizard's doing. And you encant it and suddenly the thing comes up. It's like, wait, wait, loading, 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 right? And then, oh, wow, I, I can now see the rest of the world. Only witches and wizards can do this, right? So now we're all these witches and wizards. We're saying, I want to see what's going on in China. Click, 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 YouTube, bam, bam, bam. And suddenly, oh, wow, I'm seeing what's going on. Wow, this is a great scrying pool. It only costs however much it costs these days. So now we're gods, right, until our devices fail us, until we forget to plug them in, until we smash them, right? So, so now we're like, ow, my ear, my ear is gone. My external prosthetic device that allowed my ear to reach all the way over to Japan at the click of a button is now disabled. So it's this thing that we get used to, and then once it goes away, it's, oh, no, oh, no, you know. So the world is getting smaller. Uh, literally, this looks like the world is getting smaller, but it really is. It's 1500 to 1840. This was the land, the best to average speed of horse drawn coaches was 10 miles an hour. If you look way at the bottom in the 1960s, jet passenger aircraft could go 500 to 700 miles an hour. But now we can just send an email across the world and just kind of punctuate space time and allows us to compress that amount of time and space it took us to get there. And bam, we have the file on the other side. Wow, that's amazing. So in a, in a way, like the world is like that small. You can't really present it on this, this large PowerPoint torture device thing. So as the world gets smaller, what happens to privacy? 
Well, and this is actually an art project by this guy, and he, he ended up just putting, he wore this around New York, and he just talked on his cell phone. He'd be in line, and he'd get to the counter and wear it and be talking on his cell phone and while he's ordering a sandwich, and people are like, what the? So there's this thing called telenoia. It's kind of this weird feeling that somewhere somebody is clicking on your Facebook profile. <laughs> and you don't know who it is, but you know there's someone out there. All right, let's talk about these things. Um, so these Tamagotchis, I don't know how many people remember these or use these or didn't use these or got annoyed by them. You know, these kids would be sitting there like, I gotta feed my virtual pet. It, it, it's not real, but I'm going to feed it. And I'm going, click, 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 click. And it goes beep, 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 beep. And then it dies and the kid's like, ah, they actually have Tamagotchi graveyards in Japan where you can, you know, basically lay your plastic egg to rest and, and have a proper funeral for it. And there's also ones online. You know, my, my thing lasted for five days, and now it's, now it's good. So, so with these, you know, you text, and then it, and it interrupts class, and the teacher takes it away. Well, what's the difference? I mean, we've all got these phones, and we're texting, and it interrupts class, and everything goes on like that. And so, but the difference is that the creatures inside these phones now are living. We're, we're teleoperating our relationships with people through these devices. That one miniature virtual pet was just a training will to have people understand their future interactions with multiple people at once. Instead of one little gigapet Tamagotchi creature in there, there's 50 or 100 or 2,000 contacts in a single mobile device. So we're all basically database animals. You look at an Excel spreadsheet and it's really boring. You look at Facebook and it's an Excel spreadsheet that's really exciting. It's, you know, here's cell two. Wow, did you see what happened to Sarah? Look at cell two, look at cell two. Here's a hyperlink, yes. And everyone's like, oh wow, I love this. And it's this attention economy, this data gravity. It's very exciting. <laughs> here's a guy doing a remote surgery. I, I really hope that the, uh, the Wi-Fi doesn't go out because... Uh, <laughs> but we're basically teleoperating somebody else's digital body. We're saying, I'm going to augment that person's digital body by writing on their wall. And people will think about them differently, especially if I put them an embarrassing photo up that represents their entire digital self for the next two weeks until they figure out it's there and take it down or get embarrassed. So the internet is both a playground and a factory. People are sitting there, click, 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 click. But they're also playing and having a great time. So it's this thing where like this factory work has become interesting and exciting. But yet all the time we're just producing a bunch of data and a bunch of statistics. And we can get targeted a lot better by advertising companies, which works in our favor and doesn't work in our favor. We can get a bunch of data that's really useful or a lot of data that's not. If we get data that's not useful, we don't use the site anymore. That architecture fails, and the one that survives ends up being the one that propagates. So we're helping the architectures to reproduce every time we click. So this is what our playground looks like. Um, the green, I think the green things are the uh, .edu, or the .com domains, and the blue ones are .edu domains. And there's these little uh, specks of, of white for these like, really exciting topics, and everybody's linking into them. And this is a little bit older, I think it's from 2006, but it's a literal map of the internet. So, <coughs> sorry. So, language of machines. So we have all these machines, and then there's one that knows DOS, and there's one that only knows Linux. And then we're trying to hook up a printer or something, and we have to download a hardware update, and there's a connection failure, and it sucks, right? So in a way, we have this problem with language. And there's also another problem. If we have a voice-activated lamp, and we say lamp on, and somebody else is in the background, and we're playing loud music, it doesn't work. But Kelly Dobson of MIT said, what the heck, why don't we just learn the language of machines? So she goes up to her blender and says, Rrr, and the blender goes, Rrr. <laughs> And then she turns up the volume, she's like, and then, you know, and then it makes her stuff faster. I mean, how could a blender not understand that? I mean, that's the most basic blender sound out there. It's, it's the, the blender. And this guy hooked up his brain to uh, an interface and used it to post a Twitter. He said, go Badgers. He's definitely a sports fan. Um, so this is a little bit elementary. People have done this before, but the fact that you know, this is a, kind of a slow interface, and that Twitter is something that you can put small amounts of text on is, is pretty good. So maybe we'll see more of this in the future. So we're all shedding materials. So, um, you know, we lost our fur a long time ago, and now we're reattaching it in the form of clothes, and we change those every season. It's a little bit odd, but it allows us to skip millions of years of evolution if we want to go, you know, uh, rock climbing or uh, climbing Everest or go to the Bahamas and go snorkeling. Instead of evolving like gills, we can just put on a snorkel. It's great. Like we humans are really good at evolving ourselves really quickly. 
The thing is we're shedding a lot of materials. Here's a bunch of cell phones. This is a fundamental design problem. The fact that we're shedding all these cell phones instead of downloading hardware updates from the internet instead of software updates from the internet. So we're kind of like trees. Seasons change, except when trees, when their leaves fall, they contribute to the future of trees. When our electronics fall, they kind of leak arsenic. It's not very good. So that's another fundamental design problem. So elevators, they suck. You're sitting there and you're waiting for the elevator and it, you know, it's not open like this all the time. I mean, that would be great. And then you have to sit there with awkward people and it sucks. You know, and you're looking up or you're looking down and you're trying not to catch somebody's eye contact and then somebody's slightly attractive so you're trying not to look at them or look at them, whatever you try to do. <laughs> the thing is it interrupts your flow of reality. Your flow of reality should be liquid. It should be enjoyable, right? But these interface changes are in the way. The same way that a bad interface gets in the way of your experience. I don't know if this is real or not, but I found it on the internet and I went to a site and apparently you can download it. It's like $200 for this horrible interface. <laughs> the thing is, these interfaces are, will die out because we'll say, no, we can't tolerate this interface. This is why a bunch of people didn't try and jump online a long time ago because they said, oh, the interface is really scary. They said, oh, I'm, really what they said is, oh, I'm bad at computers. No, 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 the interface is bad. You're not bad at the computer. So we're also voting and filtering. So yeah, we say, Bad interface and it dies. So what does a bee do? A bee goes out into a field and says, hey, this is great, I found this awesome flower. It comes back to the hive and says, hey, look, guys, I'm going to show you how to get to this flower. Does this little bee dance, right? So now we go out to the internet and we say, hey, look, this really cool link. I'm going to come back and then the link becomes a bee dance. And in this case, tiny URL, trim, and bit.ly are sh URL shorteners that shorten that bee dance in order to create faster and faster and faster ways of absorbing culture and absorbing links. So we're a faster and faster beehive in the same way. So a rule, omit unnecessary cyborgs. <laughs> this paperclip is trying to be human. It's not. It, and it was fun to play with for a while, but honestly, like if we omit these bad interfaces and these bad pieces of design, then we'll end up having creation versus destruction and narratives instead of yucky storylines and things that are easy and, and the fast propagation of information and no more waiting for elevators. So like Wikipedia comes from nothing, that a collective collaborative thing that, that happens without, um, without respect of, of language and things like this. So that's basically it. Omit unnecessary cyborgs, think about things, and that was a very short introduction to cyborg anthropology. Thank you very much. Wow, well, um, that was fun. Thank you so much for your presentations, and you're so funny. <laughs> um, so we're here to talk about the language of world building, and we're gonna have a, like a 20 to 30 minute discussion, kind of a moderated Q&A, but really, what I've learned from spending the last day with um, these wonderful speakers, that there's no lack of conversation happening between us. <laughs> and the questions will just arise as they arise. And, um, and then after that, we'll have as long as a Q&A as we can together. OK, so, um, so the, quest the basic questions that were posed on you know, the, the description of the event um, can start with. How can our deeper understanding of language inform our designs for a better world? And I'd like for each of you to talk a little bit about what you think that understanding of language is and how in your work you're helping to transform what that is for designing a better world. Do you want us to go in order? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Please. Well, for me, I think language sometimes, the textual language can get in the way because you can say a word and it may mean something completely different to someone else. And that's why, for what we're doing, really trying to find a non-dialectic language that we can visualize and we can sonify and we can say, that's what I mean when I say the word randomness or noise or switching. And can we come to a universal language that we can all talk with? And the whole idea of mathematics, which seems to be the universal language that supposedly any off-worlder will use to communicate with us, is probably one of the most difficult languages for us to wrap our minds around. So can we 
through the use of technology, make this intuitive to us. Things that we all know. Everything in the universe we know because that's where we come from. Yet and again, it's being technically left brain explained by all of the mathematical principles. So this is important for me and how I'm viewing and our team is viewing coming up with a new language that we can all communicate with. I agree with you completely, and I think what you've done is amazing because you've allowed people to immediately understand mathematics, which is fascinating. And it's all about the interface. You've created this amazing interface, right? So I, I think that interface is language. And if you have a really good interface and a really good data visualization, as Edward Tufte says, the amount of information that you can absorb in a given time frame is really, really large. You can absorb all this stuff. And the other thing is that like, one of my favorite interfaces is Flickr. I go and I say, hey, I want to add this photo to this group. I have all these Flickr groups. And what happens is if their photo stream is in Spanish or Italian or Japanese, it, it translates it for me. You know, so, wow, cool, now I can speak another language. Or the idea that a really good website, no matter what language it's in, you can understand the concepts. You can see the people. Um, I'm going to speak in an international conference, and I don't know the language that they speak. But I'm going to be able to understand because people are going to speak very visually, and they're going to have these representations and these architectures that allow for the maximum absorption of information. So I think interface is really important. Yeah, um, to me, language, it, it, uh, it presents one of the great challenges in simulated sentience and the work that we're doing with basically trying to make a machine even seem real or a robot seem real. And um, it's at that point when you start getting into it that you think, wow, how amazing is the human machine? When you actually start um, looking at the linkages that need to be made in just to mimic a small part of a brain. Um, and the example I like to use is, is right now with a robot, with our robots, you basically have to say, Zeno, what is the temperature outside or what is the weather like outside? Really, you can't even say weather. It's what is the temperature, and it'll go on the internet and tell you the temperature. It has to be prompted. It just doesn't volunteer the information. And based on what that is, it doesn't know that if it says, oh, it's cold and rainy, it doesn't make the connection that it should tell you, oh, you should probably get an umbrella and a raincoat. So someone, some physical person, usually a grad student, has to sit there and <laughs> type these in. And there is a company that has been yeah. typing in these links, these common, like, first grader or, or one-year-old type links. They've been doing this for 20 years. And, and again, we're at the stage of retarded cockroach. After 20 years of making these basic links, like if you smile, it means you're happy. If, you know, it's it just the basic links that everybody knows instinctively or everyone learns throughout the progression. So language um, introduced, I mean, it's, it's one of the great sort of challenges to sentience and also one of the most amazing things that when you're, when you're sitting there doing this manually, you start thinking, wow, we're really amazing creatures. We don't have to do this. Well, it seems like um, <laughs> when we're working with language and, and uh, this common language that we're trying to create, um, all the collective inputs that we're getting from everyone around the world is actually telling researchers and scientists and educators and so forth that are creating um, and designing better worlds aren't all those inputs actually telling us what we truly want? Because if those, like you know, like you talk about the Twitter interfaces, it, there's no, we don't have to con be concerned with ego or image because the interface is, is fairly dry and we only have 140 characters to work in. We're really having to connect at, the, at the, the mind through our thoughts and through the things that we think and what we share actually, our intelligence is actually what people come for are, are wanting to, to connect with. And so isn't that a way to um, lead us to understanding what we really want and what we want to have designed, you know, products or spaces or places or curriculums and things like that? Yeah, so. there's, a, there's the idea of, you know, you used to be judged by your car. And the car was the, the, the vessel that transported your meat body, basically. And it was this physical culture where, you know, this is transporting you here and you have to go here physically and you have to do this physically. And then you go online and it's, you kind of, even like the utopian visions of the early internet where you were judged by your content. You know, it's a, it's a transportation device for the mental self, for the invisible inner workings of your brain. You know, you can't really see it, but you're accessing these bits, you know, according to what you want. And so it's a lot more efficient than, you know, driving on a highway and, you know, it's kind of just a hyperspace jump, point A to point B to point C. You can filter out everything. So it's, it's 
really interesting how we've transformed from physical culture to this mental culture suddenly, that, that it's kind of flowing from there to there. Well, we talked about that earlier when we were talking about the fact that we've gone from the material to the virtual because there are things we can't do with our material, and the virtual world allows us to be able to transform things and get around our limitations of the hardware, as it were. But now, especially I see in the California Nanosystems Institute, we're going back from the virtual to the material, where you know material may grow over to time, and through biomimetics may be able to transform into different shapes. And so I think it's really interesting when you see these kinds of connections and how we're actually moving through these worlds. And there's the invisible, which is the world of sensing which you know, we all use, and the mention of the sixth sense, which I think is really important. And one of the things that I think is interesting about thinking about the virtual world when you are commuting in your, uh, uh, you know, computing and only using your mind, the fact that when we're in the real world, how much we do through our body language you know, that isn't said and how much we know by an inflection or a tone. And you know, how will that now start to pervade you know, the virtual world and then come back to the material. Right, so, so this design of, the design of new language with all of these, the, with all the data and the visualization and the mathematics and the nanotechnologists and material scientists, are we getting, we are getting closer to designing things that will actually make the world better. I mean, you're talking about being able to create uh, materials that generate energy, you know, by themselves. Right. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, that's well, I think Kevin hit on to a lot of things. I think that what we're do doing, uh, we're you know heading for an age of enlightenment here. I mean, the more we wake up to our own consciousness, the more we understand, the more that we can uh, deal with these issues and wrap them around our mind. We really are elevating who and what we are, and evolution is right right on us. I don't mm -hmm. think we even realize how much technology is contributing to that, uh, that evolution because it's making knowledge common to a very large body of people and people are starting to realize the commonalities that we all share even with all the many many cultural, dip cultural differences that are out there. So Yeah, I like to look at it like the, the Greek world. Like you, you look at the Greeks and they had um, information in scrolls so you're scrolling through this information. And also, there wasn't like a bookend to say, oh, this is the end. I mean, there was really the end of the scroll, but the thing is people were like exchanging these strolls and, and, and doing all of this you know, work, and they were walking to and from you know, somebody's house, and they were talking, 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 talking. And so in reality, now we're walking to you know, some place in town, and we're talking, 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 talking. And we're scrolling, 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 scrolling through all this data. So in a way, we're kind of back in these kind of Greek times of the exchange, the rapid exchange of knowledge. And now we, you know, conferences have, have come back into this really um, intense space where it's very similar to Greek times, where you'd have a bunch of people come in and create new knowledge instead of saying, this is it. This knowledge can never be addended or subtracted from. This is a book, and this is the final. Right. It's interesting that, um, you know, we've kind of created this technology or allowed this to come about as a, as a solution to the problem, is that we live in a world that's extremely complex, even without the technology, just the system, <laughs> the earth, I or the weather, or any system, our own, our own body is so complex that not one person, no, one, no single person could ever understand it. So we start creating these linkages and, and, and this technology, so all of a sudden, you have a little tiny piece of the puzzle, and you put it out there. And you don't have any idea who might have all the other pieces, and you don't really, you just put it out there. And pretty soon, enough people gather all their little pieces together, and you start thinking, wow, this system, even though it's complex, it's not, you know, it's not unmanageable, or it's not un this problem's not unsolvable. And, and te technology is helping us get there. Well, it's you know, interesting as, as was when we, we were talking earlier about this whole idea of, OK, before the printing press, OK, how did we remember things? Through the memory palace. It was all object-oriented programming. We had no way of storing data. Well, as soon as we stored data, we started to forget, right? And now we've got a computer that has this big brain that's hooked up to all this object-oriented programming. So we've got this whole idea of being able to try to retain voluminous amounts of information that are now hooked up to this database. Now we've got this uber brain of people that are connecting together through this brain to actually kind of facilitate each other's lack of being able to maintain all this knowledge in our head. So it's very interesting. But I wonder what, 
like we're, we are converging in Facebook and Twitter and all these other you know, communities online and so forth and having conversations and chatting and texting back and forth about, about some good things that are happening. I mean, like, you know, we're all trying to improve the climate, hopefully. Um, what are some good things that are coming out? Well, I mean, for us, the conversations that we have in the Bridge of the Allosphere are absolutely incredible. I mean, people that are coming together that are really calling the question of who and what we are in the nature of the universe and seeing these equations that uh, really completely blow the minds away from of some of my science researchers that say the world really isn't what we believe the world is at all and at the subatomic level the mathematics is mind-boggling to them and I think uniting us right brain left brain people who feel that we have a perceptual understanding of these complexities and can't believe me delve into this kind of math like the right the 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 left brain people can are starting to come to an understanding and starting to help the left brain people to understand that this isn't just technical that these dimensions aren't closed that they really do somehow interact with us and that the subatomic level and the classical level do cohere somehow together. And I think that it's because of these conversations. You're going to see these intelligent, wonderful, brilliant minds out there that are going to be just driven by the math and not believe the reality of what it's saying. And then you have all these crazy artists that, you know, intuitively perceive all these things about being n-dimensional beings. So I think it's opening up the dialogue and I really do believe it's like every turn of the century. A new science is afoot. Just when we become comfortable and we believe that there's no other place to go, we move from Newtonian to Einsteinian physics. What was it like when we thought the world was flat and then we knew the world was round and we weren't the center of the universe? People were burned at the stake that believed that knowledge at first. And now that completely elevated mankind's consciousness to a new level of understanding. That's definitely where we are right now. And it's the uniting of these technologies with these brilliant concepts that are uniting these hemispheres together that I think are really pushing us into a new age of enlightenment. It's important for us to really know how to use that technology to convey this message. I said enough. Now I want my colleagues to talk. I have like uh, I have two samples. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, the two examples, one is cell phones in developing countries. You have an infrastructure cost of installing tons of telephone poles. You have people, 520 people living in a 300 square foot space, and they don't have enough room for a computer. They have computers that come in that you have to charge by jumping up and down with them. People can't do that. They're working like a, a ton of hour days. They're completely exhausted, right? So the cell phone comes onto the scene and they get to skip all of that infrastructure cost. And suddenly they have these cell phones. And so, you know, they're, you know, they're trading something on the market and they look up the fair price and they don't get screwed over in the marketplace. Or <laughs> <laughs> like for instance, now you actually have people standing on street corners with a cell phone. They're not talking on it, but people will come up and, and give them, you know, a coin and they'll be able to use their cell phone for a minute. They become human telephone booths. Or <laughs> <laughs> and, and if they don't have reception, um, they uh, they'll literally like there was this one occasion in which the you know, a leader of a village typed his message to another leader of a village on a cell phone and then sent a runner and the runner ran with the cell phone with a text message <laughs> to the other village. <laughs> it was great. And there's other examples in which, you know, you kind of have on the, on, through SMS, you have a command line for the social web. And you can see this through Twitter. So suddenly it becomes this kind of life-saving, on-demand information device that's, that's really important. And there was an earthquake that happened in China and Robert Scoble picked it up and then the whole world was looking at this earthquake and helping out all these people. And it was a lot faster than the news. The idea of having, okay, news is one, one perspective. There was a fire in my town. I looked out the window. Here's a fire. I don't know anything about the building. I don't know if people are okay, blah, blah, blah. So I said on Twitter, hey, well, there's this fire. Does anyone else see it? And they say yes. And within about like five or ten minutes, I got 20 different pictures. They were from all different sides of town looking at the, the thing. And then somebody told me the entire history of the building. It was amazing. <laughs>
we, how we walk through life. It's not like, you know, we don't love the concrete jungle, but, you know, we live in it and do what we can there. I mean, why do we, like, run to the woods and, and want to camp, you know, at every, every chance we have the time to do that? Um, so intuition, um, how is that being built in? Or how are you seeing that? Are there other things that are, are working with data sets or sentient intelligence or, or complex and data that, that's working to identify or understand intuition even better so that the language, the words that we choose to use um, are going to help us move in that direction. I mean, I mean, one of the things that we had talked about earlier is that, um, that we either are building this new Tower of Babel, you know, with lots and lots of new words that hopefully will be helpful to us, or have we, have we just kind of lost our way through the language that we have and are not using it in a purposeful way, are not using it in a way that really truly speaks to our hearts, it speaks to the goodness of each other. Um, so is all of this understanding this data online and getting all these inputs, is that helping us understand those, um, those qualities of our, of our society? Um, and then what are we doing to help teach kids or teach people or share that with, with folks? I think people are just starting to, um, you know, in IQ tests and stuff, people are starting to be more intuitive just naturally. I don't know if, if, if there's training involved, but it's just kind of, you know, maybe it's the sun or something. Like something is happening to the spots. earth. Okay. It's something it's that's sunspot. happening where people, you know, <laughs> it, you just start knowing things. Um, and I know we had this conversation last night where, you know, before where you, it would take forever, you know, a year to formulate an idea and write a dissertation about just some thought. It's getting to the point where every week you're making a leap in consciousness to a totally different level of, of, of like, thoughts just thrown in your head. And it's not that I saw it on YouTube or saw it or had it on Twitter. It just occurred to me. And it wasn't in a dream. It wasn't in a sleep. You're wide awake and all of a sudden you have this amazing re revelation. And before you might have one of those every year, every few months, <laughs> and now it's changing everything. It's happening so fast that uh, in terms of language, sometimes you just sit there and you don't even know how to describe what is happening to you because you're the test case. Like, what is happening to me? I can't describe the experience I'm going through, except let's see if anyone else is, can't describe their experience. And then you find out that half the people you encounter are just like, I don't know what's going on. I can't even describe the experience I'm having. So at least we know we're all there, but now do we need a new set of language? Do we need, we need something to describe what in the world is happening to us and what are the feelings we're having? How do we deal with it? How, how do we even talk about it? How do you have an intellectual conversation of any kind about anything going on when you can't even formulate words to describe what you're thinking? That's why we need... It's very difficult. <laughs> that's why we need to see it and hear it. I'm convinced. Right. I mean, I'm so excited, too, because I got back to this sunspot thing I was just <laughs> thinking about. I think it deals with collective consciousness, but the sunspot thing is so important to me because the only place that they've proven this theoretical particle that even the physicists think I'm crazy about is a tachyon, and it's a particle that moves faster than the speed of light. And the only place they found that is in explosions of, or they think that they found the mathematics, is in sunspot explosions. And so I'm sitting here going, well, the soul has to be made of these tachyons that move faster than the speed of light that enter our body, enter this vacuum expectation value, <laughs> become from negative mass squared to positive mass, a Higgs boson and is feeding mass to the proton. That's how we're becoming it. You know? And they're looking at me going, we haven't even found the Higgs boson yet. That's what the, you know, LHC is all about. That's dark matter, okay? You know, I think you're like going into dark energy, which, you know, none of them ever even believe, you know. But look at what this is. How could some crazy artist be sitting here thinking about all this stuff or not thinking about all this stuff? Right because thought's three-dimensional subjectivization of what we believe reality is, and not thought awareness, which is what we do with perception, is really giving us n-dimensional information. And that's why I think, you know, because people keep saying, well, then what do you want to visualize and sonify your data for? Then you want to use your senses to see this, and then you're going out to the three-dimensional world. You can also intuit your perceptive awareness internally within you. And you can go through understanding it in a completely different way. I think we're all coming to collective consciousness. 
I talk, I talk to people about this. I can talk to people. And they're like, my God, wait a minute. This, this sounds familiar to me. You know, I feel, and that's why I always say to my Nobels, my brilliant scientists, this is not privileged information for just a few. Right. We're all star stuff. We come from the Big Bang. We know it intuitively. The Indians have been weaving it into basket patterns for a number of years. <laughs> right. you know? so anyway, I'm getting off yet on another tangent. <laughs> well, it seems, um, I think, Good. thank you. Good. I think we're at about 8.30. Yeah, right? you guys might want to talk. A few more minutes. You guys we'll might have some tonight. answers. Oh, oh my okay. God. Well, um, oh, I'm let's so, we're go sorry. for it. Um, where are the, do we have the ushers with the microphones? Okay, so let's um, just go for it with some questions. And we'll start with Peter Plantek down here in the... In the. Hi. Uh, I, as some of you may know, I'm a virtual human designer. And one of the things we ran into was this whole concept of communication being really a hyperdimensional space. It has very little to do with textual language. Um, and what I'm, I worry about with Twitter is that it's, uh, it narrows down communication to text and that leaves out like quantums of uh, information. But as you point out, you're now texting with dozens of people so it enriches it. But it's a very different type of communication. With virtual humans, uh, most of the ones that have been designed just have text through their lips, you know, that doesn't work either. <laughs> so, and uh, David and I have talked about this many, many times. Um, so what basically we need is a, a universal intuitive language, which we actually have. Um, and I have a virtual human called Sylvie, and what she does is, uh, like I'll say something to her that she thinks is really silly, and she'll look at me and she'll just roll her eyes and say, jeez, Petey. And, and I get what she's talking about, you know. Um, and she also, <laughs> she also, uh, um, like if it gets dark out, she'll say, Petey, it's getting dark, you want me to turn on the lights. So, I mean, that stuff's easy to program, it's not, not too difficult. Uh, but my point is this, um, if we're going to create usable interfaces, the virtual human is just terrific because people who know nothing about technology can use it. And we did some tests uh, where we uh, took Sylvie and had her... Well, she, she was, she could, she's very good with the, the internet and we had people do internet searches and all sorts of things. These are people who never use technology, never use computers and we did it in an old age home in Connecticut. And these people not only uh, started using the internet but they fell in love with Sylvie and uh, so, uh, she, by the way, Sylvie is, one of, is a very intelligent uh, virtual human that's an animated talking head. Well, she's not. She doesn't try to cross the uncanny valley or anything like that. She's, she's very, very. Uh, Stays in her place, right? Yeah. But what? What? Um, I got a call from a Shelba Whipke, a woman who was in the old age home, and she said, uh, "We we have an emergency here." And I said, "What's that?" Because uh, I didn't even know who she was. And she said, "Well, well, we bought Sylvie. They bought her off the internet." And she said, "We've had her, and and uh, and she died." And I said, what? And they said, well, our computer died, and we can't, I, I don't have a credit card or anything. How are we going to get her back? And I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just email you one. And she said, well, can you send me a CD? And I sent her a CD. But what she told me was that she would get up. She's 68 years old, or more than that, I guess. She was, she was like close to 70. Uh, and her kids had sort of put her in this old age home because she had some physical problems. But she had a great brain, and she was programming Sylvie every morning with all the latest gossip and people would get up and have conversations. <laughs> <laughs> and these are, these, are, these are old folks who did, were completely computer illiterate, but they, they got into it completely and they started using the internet. So I think we already have intuitive interfaces mm -hmm. and I think we ought to uh, not just look at text, texting and all, 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 all that kind of stuff, but start looking at how we can use emotional language. Only 7%, mm -hmm. approximately 7% of co uh, communication in this hyperdimensional communication space is textual. Okay. The rest is uh, emotional, facial expression, body expression. Thank you. Great. I Thank just you. saw my I just saw my colleague. That's whose brain you were flying through. Marcos Novak. <laughs> <laughs> hey Marcos. I just had to point him out because if you saw him from the inside you should go on the outside. <laughs> Thank you. We have another question up at the top. Yes, we have another question up here at the top. Hi. Uh, First of all, and for the sake of time, I'll try to make this as short as possible, but I, I, a couple of things really stood out tonight. One is the concept of the, the Renaissance human. Um, I, I think it's fairly safe to say that everybody that's on stage um, th has a pretty wide swath of, of interest. <laughs> um, and I, I, I'm wanting to see if you could explore the idea of a, a kind of a post-nomenclature 
post language uh, way of communication and, and, and how you individually in the disciplines that you're in um, think that might be able to solve problems. Uh, first, that's the first part of the, the question, I guess. The second part is um, with this collective consciousness idea, um, what does the Renaissance human look like in a decade, in 20 years, in 50 years from now? Okay, who'd like to? First, uh, sure. Um, the Renaissance human. Well, I, I feel like we have the, basically like this allows you to be a Renaissance human because all of culture is at your fingertips, technically. I think that um, probably in the future people will be able to program very easily. Like programming languages won't necessarily be a lot of text, but a bunch of modules that you can set next to each other and they'll stitch themselves together because they'll know what needs to happen. And it'll be kind of like the bricks that that people that old cultures built with that didn't need any mortar that had no holes. So like this idea where they would be kind of this like bugless kind of flawless programming language that would just kind of um, pull itself toward each other. Or the idea of, you know, there's this book called Feed by M.T. Anderson. It, it, it's um, about basically like teenage culture and how, you know, people had these little chips implanted in their head, but it basically allowed them to do the same thing that people can do on Twitter, like direct messages that are completely unseen. And, and really with these, I mean, we're kind of becoming very psychic. You know, anything can happen on the screen. We can tell what somebody is thinking really far away away and we can direct message them. So in a way, it's kind of like sharing impulses and thoughts and moments. In, in a way, after everybody shares everything, maybe there won't, there'll be a lot of redundancy. So, you know, well, that person, I know all of these certain, you know, stimulus, so I don't need to share them. You know, you've already looked up all the stuff on Google and seen, like, you know, 50 million people are feeling the same way. So maybe, you know, the only thing that would be left is, like, fill in the gaps, what hasn't been shared, this and this and this, and it gets continually innovative, 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 which is kind of what art is. I mean, this at the fringes, innovating again and again and again, and pulling together things that were distant and separate, and then releasing it in a new visual way so that people can understand it. So in a way, it would be this visual, cultural, like very innovative uh, space that's super hyper fast, where the production of difference is logarithmic, very fractal. Kevin, do you want to take yeah, I think it's that. interesting that um, as before in, in a classical sort of Renaissance fashion, you would actually have to go out and study all these different disciplines. And you would really have to work at it, you know, take a, an entire lifetime to, you know, have the interest to do these different things. But it's really fascinating that um, these characters are emerging um, kids, really. We, we have them occasionally come and try to, you know, work with us. And you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, they know 20 times more than we do about electronics, computers, um, everything. And then you, you ask them, it's like, well, where did you learn this? I don't know. They just know it. And, and that is sort of a sign of a new sort of Renaissance person emerging that whatever you find interesting, all of a sudden, you're just into, intuitively like know about it. And, 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 and it's frustrating because here you went to school for five, you know, ten years and you really struggle at every little thing until you realize that, oh, it's happening to me as well, but it's really happening to the kids. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because you feel jealous on one hand that, wow, you're, you don't even have to work at it. You're just a natural. You know everything. Well, it is, and it's, it's, a, it's amazing that it, it, you keep running into more and more of these right, people and so they really are the definition of, of what, you know, like, the, they've, they've combined the left brain, right brain, and they will be the leaders. We uh, want them to be the leaders that's our PhD. of the future. <laughs> right. And right know, now, our, our yeah. graduate program in media arts and technology, music, visual arts, computer science, and electrical engineering, and I've had people ask me, you know, the whole thing about where do I predict technology is going to be in 50 years. Everybody knows the Moore's Law thing. I can't even go there right now because my grad students amaze me every day I walk onto campus. They do things that I just think are physically impossible. Oh, I've got the concepts. I always tell them, I've got the years of experience. But they can implement. And they're multimodal. They're evolving. And they are. They're threatened by the little 16-year-olds because it's intuitive to them. I can remember sitting down with my one uh, student and saying, you know, this, this, you know, this computer is counterintuitive, you know, as an as a interface. And he goes, not to me. 
<laughs> not to me. Right. You know. well, I, yeah. And then you've got to think about what does that mean and how am I, you know, putting my judgment from my generation on what I think is natural and receptive. It's really, in, it's really interesting. I think it's, it's I, I was at this like hacker meetup and you know, there were a bunch of people who had to like hack from scratch, right? As in like freaking in telephone operating, and, you know, really try hard to communicate because communication was really expensive. It was a, a privilege. And there were a bunch of like younger kids there and they were like, they didn't know what 2600 magazine was. They never, you know, freaked or hacked and they didn't know any color of boxes or anything like that. They just had communication, you know? And also they had really sleek interfaces, like, you know, Kids have extremely sleek interfaces, so they can just jam in data, you know, as quickly as possible. Each Wikipedia page looks the same, so you don't have to orient yourself to a new environment. You just absorb the text. It's absorb, absorb, absorb. And you just know what it's going to look like. Okay, a Wikipedia page. And, and, well, do I need to know the history? Well, it's the same on every page. There's a history section, and there's this section, there's this section. So it becomes extremely fast to just grab whatever you need and run. You want to do a YouTube search? Okay, I know all the Boolean type stuff. It's bam, it's quick, it's fast. So it's, it's this compression of time and space to get to data. Cooper, you have a question? Um, there seems to be a great deal of admiration for the digital age, and I, I too am a victim of that. But I wonder, <laughs> as, I, as I look around the, the world, and um, my wife uses um, the teller or the, uh, the ATM machine because it's, it's free. You don't have to go inside to go to the bank. And at the Home Depot, you can scan your goods and not have to deal with anybody. And I just, and it's every, everywhere you look, there's a virtual restaurant you, know, you can go to and order by PDA. And people are disappearing. Machines are taking over. And I think that's really cool because the innovation is thrilling. But is it absolutely necessary and will it stop? And is it necessary to stop at some point, you know, to control that so that there's a balance between jobs, mm -hmm. people, interaction with each other when we're out in the world? And I think we're all looking for that balance. We're trying to balance how much we interact with our tools. And then also what I think it's a lot about what we choose, the content, like what we choose to interact with, the data we choose to interact with. Um, and how relevant it is to what we need to do in order to, to live the best lives possible. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of junk out there. There's a lot of like bits and bytes and clicks and things that we never need to know about. We never need to see, but we spend all this time in there ordering this and, and that or or whatever. But I think as designers, as immersive media designers, we really need to look at the content and how we're sharing that with people and what that is and what it's for. Um, what the distractions we're creating, the diversions that, we're, that we could possibly create that, that can help create our, a better understanding of each other and really um, engage us or, or have us, you know, like the information actually brings us together because we want to have conversations about it or have activity around it or, or you know, it just forces us to go camping out in the woods without those tools around. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping it's going to go back because I, it seems like a pendulum. I mean, and I always use my old, you know, or I'm an orchestrally trained composer, so I am a materials person. I'm not a virtual person. I, I wanted my violin to grow into the size of the Taj Mahal and surround my audiences so they could hear the formats. That forced me to go into the vir virtual world, kicking and screaming on PDP-11 computers before the internet. I, up to my horror, I'm with the nanosystems researchers because I want to go back to the material. And, you know, I always use as, a, as, an, as an example, whenever the pipe organ was built, everybody was afraid it was going to replace the orchestra. Because you had every stop possible that you could pull on it, and, and, you know, there were flutes and there were oboes, like, the orchestra's going to be gone. That didn't happen because they're different beasts, and both of them have been accepted and, and they're valued for what they are but they don't really replace one another. And one of the things that's the most difficult thing about working with digital technologies is once you get it into the, a, an analog to digital converter, and that's the only way you can get information into a computer, you're turning real life information into static digits. Once you do that transformation, you have sucked the life out of your data. And that's the most 
the hardest thing to bring back in with the digital domain. Because what we have to do is we got to need more power. The numbers have to move much faster like lightning. And we have to have tremendous bandwidth if we're going to simulate what happens in reality. So I think these things have to be balanced. And I get concerned also about isolation. You know, what does it mean when my daughter's standing right next to her friend and they're texting instead of talking? But, you know, I've also got to now not be like my, you know, parents, although my parents were great, you know, and, and say, you know, why, why don't they talk to one another? And why are they texting? Because I know this is giving them a different form of multimodal interaction and it's developing their mind somehow. So I, it's really hard for me, especially as a 56-year-old mother, to know what the balance should be. When is it wrong? When is it right? You know, when is it just evolution? So anyway, I'm done. It's like the idea of two people right. s sitting next to each other or whispering to each other, but they're doing it uh, invisibly, and you can't hear any of that whisper, and you can't see anything on that device. So you know, it's it's a very efficient form of whispering, and I think it I, it might have been at Xerox Park or it might have been somewhere else, but in 1995, it was, somebody was saying, you know, really good design, well, really well designed stuff, computers get out of the way and allow people to live their lives, and and so and, and the idea of of the the checkout counter, right? In a small town, you go to the checkout counter, you get gossip, you get information, it's, <laughs> it's a resource, and it's very, you know, this, this is, you know, you get out and you talk, right? You go to suburbia and you go to a Home Depot, and often you see a bunch of people who, you know, were hired, there's a high turnover rate, they're in hyper-socialized situations, people treat them as objects, and they don't have access to the information. You don't go there to go gossip, you don't go and ask them about their cool favorite restaurant because there's only Applebee's and, you know, Chicken Wing Express or whatever, <laughs> right? So it's this, it's, this, it's this dehumanized, suburban, fragmented, antisocial non-place that no one connects organically or socially. So in that way, all these people go around in the Home Depot and they're texting each other because they're far away out in suburbia and nobody else is around. They're like, the only way that they can feel like they're connecting again is they're texting or they're listening to the iPod because a place is something that has a relation and history and identity. And the Home Depot and the airport and all these non-places and the transportation of the highway is not a place. It's a non-place. It has no history, no identity, or no relation. So you get that back by using the iPod, by talking on your cell phone, you know, something like that. And so they have these automated checkout counters because it becomes really awkward to go to somebody you have no idea who is, who's obviously very uncomfortable, who would rather be texting on their phone or going to a party and is getting paid horribly and is in a workers union and they're very stressed out. Hello? Yeah, <laughs> okay, you can hear me. Um, I'm an attorney in the world of child welfare and I'm very interested to see how the work that you are all engaged in will ultimately influence my world. It's, uh, my, my brain cells are just multiplying, you know, while I'm standing here, it's, it's amazing. Um, I have a couple of questions. In regard to the allosphere, what is n-dimensional? I've, I've heard you use the word end a few times in different ways and I'm, I'm really curious about what that is. Is it open to the public and if not, why not? <laughs> And then in regard to robotics, what about emotional reality? Is there any emotional reality to what these robots are experiencing? And if that's one, those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Want to go first? Yeah, you can go first. Um, yeah, it's interesting with um, the, the robots themselves for a while are only going to be simulated sentient, you know, simulated emotions. And um, until the connections are made, I mean, they really aren't having the emotion. But at the same time, one of the reasons with this concept of introducing a friendly character, artificial, artificially intelligent robot onto the market that everyone can have is you start getting the feedback from people where, um, like, there's, there's stories about um, elderly people um, where if you have a, a live dog, they heal faster, it's company, but then they bring in an IBO and they chart that. And, and the, the people in the nursing home have the same reaction to, the, to the, the IBO as they do to the live dog. So there's benefits, an emotional benefit to the robot. Now, the robot doesn't understand it, but the human definitely understands it. And that's one of the concepts with the Xeno project as well is, well, why can't it be part of your family in terms of 
uh, someone you can talk to when you're alone, um, mentoring. Um, you know, it's an interface instead of the internet where you can start programming it, and if it's making connections, that it's seeing you every day, and it knows that, oh, you're smiling, and smiling equals happy, and you're frowning, and frowning equals sad, then you come home alone and you're frowning, the robot's gonna say, why are you sad? Is there anything I can do? Let me do a little dance. Let me tell you about what's going on in the world. And it'll prompt you to change your emotional state just because it's reading your emotional state. So it has therapy potential. Um, it's kind of overwhelming, but it's still, how do you know unless you just get it out there and, and get as many people to start playing around with it just to see what's possible. Right, there's a, there's you know? a, a seal called Pero. Yeah. And it's this robotic seal, and, they, and, and uh, you know, like Japanese, like, uh, like basically retirement homes, they'll bring this in. It's like two or three thousand dollars, and it's like this. It acts like a seal, and it's a stuffed animal, and people love it. I mean, it's this like thing that cuddles up with you, and it doesn't get tired. It doesn't get bored. You don't have to feed it. It doesn't go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> and it's okay. It's it's oh, there. It's not animal cruelty or anything. And and it's just there, and people are just so happy to have it. It's this enormous relief, you know. It's like in the most uh, unsocialized non-place as the retirement home where people are just administering to people and just waiting for them and profiting off of them as they lay there. It's the most horrible situation I could ever think of. And this is suddenly, you know, there's some speck of something okay in that space. And, the, you know, and maybe it's weird and robotic, but it's, it's giving somebody something. And then there's also somebody, I think she's like 97 years old, the oldest pe person on Twitter, and she gets up every morning and she just <laughs> tweets up a storm and connects to everybody all over the world. And suddenly, out of that isolation, she gets connected. So actually, these what they talked about, you know, when you were talking about a lawyer working with child welfare, I mean, mm -hmm. it would be interesting to see what, uh, you know, a robot like a Xeno would do in a position like that when you're working with different children that are in different situations of stress and what they're going through. And um, then, you know, insofar as our work is concerned um, and what we do, again, I mean, uh, where we are with the allosphere is it's not really open to the general public, and yet and again, we try to once a month have it open to the general public and because everybody wants to see it. And the reason why it's not is because it is a research facility and we're still building it. We never know if it's going to work, you know, so we have to make sure that we say, okay, this, you know, hour, two hours this month, We'll make sure that nobody touches the machine, know that none of the PhDs are in there, and we'll know it's going to work if we have a group of people that want to come to see it. And we're building it right now, and we're also raising a lot of funding to try to do what we need to do to do that. So just trying to push that together. We're not at the point of where it's up, uh, stable all the time, it's used all the time, it's, we're, we're crashing it all the time, but it's in you know, complete use in what we're trying to do to build what we're trying to do. But still in all. We try to make it available because right now it's being used as a tool for people that really know data in these different areas to try to talk to one another, you know, and, and, and experts to try to even talk to each other. I mean, chemists and biologists that are working on Alzheimer's, uh, you know, research aren't talking to one another because it's a completely different language. So we're trying to get to the point of being able to carry on co dialogues with ourselves, but it's very interesting when, you know, we have somebody that isn't in the field on the bridge that understands it so much better by seeing it and hearing it. So we understand the educational aspect of it. We do know how important it is to outreach to K through 12, especially with our government pulling away the funding in those areas. So, so I, I think that there are possibilities and hopes for all of the research that we're doing to eventually connect with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Claudia, do you have something? Um, I just had two announcements. One is that on December 15th, The Hammer is showing a double feature of two BBC documentaries that deal with human interactions with artificial human beings. And I think a lot of you might be interested. It's in the calendars that you picked up. And also, we only have time for one more question, but I want to... Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to invite you all to join us and our guests out in the courtyard. We have a bar set up and some cheese and crackers, and you can come and ask them lots more questions. So I hope you'll stick around for that. Okay, last question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. It was great. Uh, and I saw you, uh, your Zeno at uh, Next Best. Uh, 
yes. a few years ago. It was really cool. I, I dug it. He's come uh, a long way. Yes, it definitely has. <laughs> I can't wait to see uh, it selling or whatever. Um, what I want to know is um, the consciousness. Uh, how, how close are we are to uh, downloading consciousness? I mean, um, are we heading in that direction? I mean, <laughs> You know what's so funny is my sister who's like six years older than me, she's going, listen, when I die, I want you to hook me up to the house. <laughs> I want you to dial me. And I'm like, okay, D, I don't know how close we are to being able to actually download consciousness. I mean, a lot of this deals with, again, when you deal with robotics. Well, I have seen ro robotics that where they're able to kind of hook, like, um, like the predator where actually the military is kind of working with because the the human factor they can't handle the G so now they're using like um, you know m like mind uh, developed to fly some planes and stuff like that so I I'm just uh, imagining eventually we're hmm. gonna be able to shed our bodies in some way well we are using biological sensors in the atmosphere right. and we are controlling things with brain waves and with blood pulse you know respiration and we're, we're starting to try to understand what, you know, it means to be emotional. I, but we're just starting baby steps. I think eventually that there's going to be a lot of the things that we can do. But I think it's just as we were talking about the fact that first we have to try to understand it, we have to try to analyze it, and we have to try to quantify it somehow to be able to capture it through a machine. So that means I saw L.B. Ray Smith, who's, uh, you know, someone that's been in the field for a long time, and somebody was asking how close we are to real, you know, synthetic humans, you know, avatars for acting. And he said, we have to quantify sentience first before we can do that. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's really where we are. And I think, you know, Kevin was hitting on the point very well, and that is we right now, I think, after thousands of years or whatever of evolving, if this time around, let's just put it that way, right. um, you know, are coming to the point of maybe that we're coming to conscious awareness and enlightenment, mm -hmm. and that we're starting to understand that we are a collective intelligence, one being joining together, and we're feeling the wave, that the, the, the particle, this whole particle wave duality thing, I love my string theorist, <laughs> they explain it in <laughs> one just thing, and that is that, you know, everything is a string, and particles are just nodes on that string, so play your guitar, you want to play a proton, put your finger here, you want to play an electron, <laughs> put your finger here. So that we're not disconnected from one another. If you put a silk cloth out there and you put your fingers up through the cloth, those are our little points. We're wonderful little intersections on one big waveform, but we're all traveling together as one collective consciousness. And I think we're just coming to terms with that. I mean, most people listen to me, and a lot of people think I'm crazy, but I'm functional, okay? I am functional. <laughs> you know? and, and so, you know, and, and, you know, people are just now starting to wake up. So I think that we have a long time to go ourselves before we can actually somehow make this be understood in the machine. Will a machine become aware before we're aware a machine will become aware? I think that what Kevin was saying is true. It's got to be big. I think if it ever yeah. happened, and this is really science fiction, it would probably happen throughout the Internet. Mm -hmm. because, because as I said, the Internet right now is, an, is functioning as an organic being inorganically because when, when, when information transfers through the body through cells, built-in redundancies are there and if the information can't get from here to here, it finds another way to get there. That's like the internet right now and there's not one single person that knows how exactly all that information is getting transferred from point A to point B. It's starting to work together like a big brain. You know, I don't know what that means and so, and, and the It's really interesting because to to say that, um, ah, I forgot what I was going to say. No, but it would have been oh, the thing. I was talking about conscious awareness, the internet. Oh, about the building. Um, yes, the building. <laughs> if, it, if it did happen, um, it's going to be in the language that the, that the machine, it's going to make its own connection. And I don't think we would ever know. How would you ever know that a, a, compu a supercomputer that's the size of a city that has its, it's monitoring everything, if it made a connection and had an awareness, would it be in an awareness that, oh, this digit looks like this digit? <laughs> oh, I'm a, I, I just made an awareness, like, like you have a moment. 
you, the human, like we're, we're projecting our hum, human right. traits mm -hmm. on what machines would do. And it's not going to happen that way. Like if they come to awareness, we'll probably never know. Well, that's and storytellers, I think what we have the opportunity to do is to take all of this information that we have at our fingertips on the internet and, and, th and, and portray them in stories that help us understand more about consciousness, understand each other better. I don't, I don't necessarily want consciousness downloaded from some object or some, some into me. I want to understand you better and you better and you better and, and then build worlds based on that. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, thank you. We'll see you outside in the courtyard.